I'm a retired school teacher and farmer, um, and as you heard, we, we have been farming organically for some time now. Um, but I, I wanted today to be a sort of a challenge for all of us as organic farmers to move into something beyond what we're already doing. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those strategies uh, into the future. I hope you guys are enjoying the live show. Great. So as was mentioned, um, we, well actually she didn't mention, we were married in 1987, we met in Calgary, um, Al was working in the oil patch and I was a school teacher uh, in French immersion and uh, we moved to the farm in 89 and became certified organic in 2000. We went to a holistic management conference in 2007 in Russell, Manitoba where Al discovered that, well, maybe raising livestock in the way that he did as a, as a young boy uh, was not necessarily the way it had to be done. And so we got into cattle the following year and have uh, certified them and raised them completely on grass. The beginning of my journey into <laughs> agroecology <laughs> um, Actually, as you heard, started with development and peace. Um, we've had several campaigns in recent years. Development and peace operates on, on two sort of systems. We, we try to educate Canadians about how our lifestyles affect people in the global south. And we also um, do some fundraising to assist our partners in the global south. And in recent years, we have teamed up, say, with uh, La Via Campesina. We have uh, done some work to support small-scale farmers in the Global South. And that's how I started hearing the term agroecology, was through development and peace. And of course, um, they did send me to COP21 in Paris, as you heard. And this is my little reminder of the meaning of the climate summit in Paris. There was this huge tree full of ribbons and the, the idea was that you could go and write why this climate summit was important to you on a ribbon and then take a ribbon home with you as a reminder. And so this ribbon was written out by Claudia, 27 years old. She's in Paris, but she was born in Romania. And she said, I love walking bare feet in the morning in the green grass and I don't want to lose nature and she has little pictures of grass and butterflies and flowers and suns and whatever. So that's my sort of reminder of Paris. At that time I made a commitment to myself. We, we walked away from that summit as um, civil society, like we weren't allowed into the precincts of the decision making, but we walked away with a sense that we needed to make a personal commitment. And my personal commitment was I was going to talk about agroecology every chance anybody gave me. And so today is one of those opportunities. I do believe that we need to move forward beyond what we're doing as organic farmers. We're already on the right track, but we need to go farther. We need to preserve our wetlands, preserve our woodlands, embrace ecological farming practices, and actually join the movement. So one of the first things that I needed to do if I was going to talk about this was figure out, well, what the heck does that mean? I spoke to many farmers uh, leading up to the World Social Forum in Montreal this past summer, and so many of them had kind of heard the word, but okay, what is it? Is it permaculture? Is it regenerative agriculture? So I needed to research it. And fortunately, the World Social Forum also provided me that opportunity. An organization called SIDSI had put on several workshops and panel discussions. And so I began to get a sense of, well, what does this mean? The term was first coined in about the 1930s by um, Basil Benson. Now, I have conflicting information. He's either a Russian or a Czechoslovakian agronomist. But anyway, from out there somewhere. Um, and it just it basically merged the notion 
or the science of agronomy with the science of ecology. Then in the 1960s, it sort of took on another dimension to its meaning and referred to, it wasn't just a scientific discipline at that time, but it started to embrace different branches um, and it, agroecology developed following the environmental movement in the 60s that really was going against the industrial agricultural um, system. So in response in the 1970s to the Green Revolution, which intensified our pesticide and fertilizer use, the concept of agroecosystems evolved to talk about a domesticated ecosystem. And so that was the agricultural ecosystem. In the 80s, Miguel Altieri, who is one of the um, gurus of agroecology, uh, a professor actually at Berkeley University, uh, defined agroecology as an approach to protect our natural resources, soil and water in particular, and it's a way of designing and managing sustainable agroecosystems. So agrobiodiversity became a primary component of agroecosystems. In 2003, um, it was then defined as an inter integrative study of ecology, and it started to include all kinds of other um, disciplines, uh, especially in the education system. It defined a new way of considering agriculture and its relationship to society, and becoming more environmentally friendly and more sustainable and an alternative to high input intensive agriculture. Stephen Gleisman, another uh, guru of agroecology and professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, has written extensively on the subject. There are currently programs in agroecology at both U of M in Winnipeg and UBC. So it also it became very interdisciplinary at that point, including ecology, zoology, botany, plant physiology, geography, and socioeconomics. And so where agroecology initially dealt with just crop production and protection aspects, it has evolved to include new dimensions, uh, such as environmental, social, economic, ethical, and development issues. Today, the term agroecology can either mean a scientific discipline, an agricultural practice, or a political social movement. Agroecology as an agricultural practice emerged in the 80s and was often intertwined with the movements. And we're going to... Um, Load the video. <laughs> yeah. Nope. So I have a short uh, video um, from Miguel Altieri, who will discuss a little bit about the place of agroecology in our current <coughs> context. <coughs> yeah. We know one thing for sure is that it just to get it up on the screen. Oh, it's not on the screen. that microphone to the bathroom when you go. <laughs>
produces contamination of the environment with pesticides and fertilizers that are causing all kinds of environmental problems and health problems worldwide. It is calculated that just in the United States, the environmental costs and health costs of agriculture, modern agriculture is $4 billion per year. So it's a huge cost. And there, there, is, no altern there is no other alternative but agroecology in order to come up with, uh, with an alternative to produce enough food that is going to be healthy, but it's going to be accessible to. So today we know that peasants, which are about um, 350 million farms worldwide, feed 50% of the world population. And most of those peasants, I would say 80% of them, are producing with agroecological methods. That is, methods that are based on their traditional knowledge, millinery knowledge, that have that has been passed from generation to generation, and some of them have been influenced by NGOs and other organizations that have been working with agroecology uh, to optimize the productivity of small farming systems throughout the world. And obviously we know that the problem of feeding the world doesn't have anything to do with production. So uh, I agree that we can enhance productivity and we can feed the world with agroecological methods. Uh, and the, the matter of scale is not the area, it's the number of farmers and also the productivity per hectare. For example, in Cuba, which is the only post peak oil agriculture in the world, uh, you have farmers that belong to the ANAP, which is the National Association of Small Farmers, that in one hectare they produce enough food to feed between 15 and 30 people based on protein or based on carbohydrates, depends on what they're producing with energy efficiencies between 15 and 30. That means they put one kilocalorie and they obtain 30 kilocalories. The average efficiency of industrial agriculture is 1.5. So we're talking about very efficient, very biodiverse, and also very resilient systems because what's happening is that we're seeing that everywhere studies have been done on the impacts of climatic events, extreme climatic events on productivity, more cultures are the first to go polyculture systems, agroforestry systems, diversified farming systems that small farmers have are the ones that are resilient. They're the ones that resist the impact and the ones that recover faster from the impact. So industrial agriculture is not going to only be limited by, by the ecological problems that it's causing or by the, the cost of, uh, of the petroleum, but also by not having ecological diversity that provides them, them with resiliency, they're going to collapse with climate change. So what we need is an alternative, which is agroecology, and that agroecological system is already being tested by thousands of farmers. The Via Campesina, actually, which is the largest peasant organization in the world, already adopted agroecology as their scientific technological approach to productivity within their food sovereignty framework. And uh, it's a matter of time as this methodology, this knowledge that starts being transferred through the farmer to farmer, the campesino campesino methodology, uh, it will reach thousands of farmers, not only within the rural areas, but also in the urban areas. I hope that keeps it off. <laughs> ah, can't find where it was. There. So what does all this mean for organic farmers? I think I would like to propose a new paradigm and what I've based it on is um, a document by National Farmers Union called Agroecology in Canada, Food Sovereignty in Action. And if you would like a copy, there are some here on the table. Uh, if I don't have enough, there will be more at the um, NFU table. Oh. Thank you. 
forgot to do that. So this document provides us with eight pillars, common pillars of agroecology. Number one, it is a way of life. And I think as organic farmers, we have seen that organic is a way of life also. So it's not just a set of technologies. It would bring communities together to create solutions that are local and specific to that area. So we would, agroecology does not look the same in various places. It has solutions that are site specific. And we need to move into respecting labor, um, as well as the environment, not just the land itself, but also the, the labor that creates the agriculture. So let's value our labor and the labor of those who work with us. And let's bring everybody on board with us. Uh, invite consumers to be part of this dialogue, to be part of this community, to help us to move ahead. Number two. Production practices should be based on ecological pr principles. So I'm looking at, and I heard about it uh, this weekend, uh, no-till, reduced till and no-till organics, intercropping cover crops, living mulch, and integrating of livestock into our growing systems. For more information about reduced till and no-till agriculture, we can turn to the University of Manitoba and Dr. Martin Ense's program um, on natural systems agriculture. Um, and also you heard yesterday that the Rodale um, Institute have been doing experiments on this no-till organic for quite a while. And there's a link there. You can build your own roller crimper apparently. And so um, if you go to the Rodale Institute's um, website, you will find information about doing that. So those do-it-yourselfers out there, um, you could move kind of into that category. We also have done some grazing with our um, green uh, plow downs and had very good results with that as well. So you don't just have to terminate it by crimping it, you can also uh, gain a lot by grazing your cattle and I believe there was a session yesterday that talked about all the numbers related to that. Our soils again are really our best defense against climate change and climate disruption. We hear a lot when we talk about climate change about reducing our fuel consumption and yes granted but there's not really much discussion right now about how agriculture can mitigate climate change and climate disruption. So we need to work on increasing the net balance of carbon that enters the soil relative to what is lost. And we can influence that dynamic by de decreasing the disturbances which allows the soil aggregates to be formed and protected. Increase mass of plant and animal inputs. This improves soil microbiology and micro microbial diversity and abundance. Microorganisms transform plants residue into smaller carbon molecule, molecules that are much more likely to be protected and sequestered than metabolized by smaller organisms such as fungi and bacteria. And these fungi, fungi also produce compounds that improve aggregate stability. And yesterday, Dr. Um, Catherine Nichols, she went through that whole sequence and I was just totally amazed because yeah, that's it right there. I can't repeat it. I'm not the expert, but certainly um, there's much for us to um, digest. Rotational grazing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we attended a holistic management um, conference in 2007, which launched us into our cattle production. And we imitate, through that rotational planned grazing, we imitate the action of bison on the prairie. The hoof action, the manure that they leave behind, is what really can continue to regenerate the prairie. And so we need to look at that as a new practice. It maximizes pasture biomass and redistributes carbon throughout the pasture. 
And according to uh, Holistic Management International, <coughs> with every 1% of increase of organic matter in the soil, we can pull down as much as 36 tons per acre of CO2 from the atmosphere. Now we have to make sure that we recognize that there, there will be a place where we reach saturation of carbon in the soil, but for now we can actually pull some of that excess CO2 from the atmosphere and really make it a, an impact right now. With frequent moving and high density stocking, uh, we prevent overgrazing and enhance the pasture biomass. Number three in the common pillars, reduction of externally purchased inputs. And I think with organic farming, we do a lot of that. We do not apply chemical fertilizer and pesticide. However, one of the things we're, we're trying to move into is also not going and purchasing organic inputs. Um, that that should be sort of within your own farm, on your own land, a cycle, a closed circuit. It has been found that chronic nitrogen additions to the soil reduce the microbial activity, and I think that was the disconnect that Dr. Nichols was talking about yesterday, that there's an increased need for more and more nitrogen because we've disconnected from that microbial activity in making the nitrogen available to the plants. Cover crops and crop rotations, including periodic green fallows, semi-perennial crops such as alfalfa, have demonstrated benefits for weed suppression and soil fertility, and research suggests they can also lead to carbon sequestration. I've included there a couple of pictures of our St. Foin field. We are trying to move away from alfalfa because of the threat of GM alfalfa, and we uh, just bailed this up this year for the first time, and it's, it's a beautiful crop. Um, we understand it's, it's high uh, nutrient value for the cattle and apparently very palatable. We're going to test that out this, this winter. Number four, peoples and communities who feed the world need their collective rights protected. And this is where I think the, the movement, the political movement aspect of agroecology starts to, to cut in. We need to protect our seed saving rights. Uh, UPO, UPOV 91 has really decreased and degraded the right of farmers to do that. We moved from having the right to the privilege of saving our own seed. And so we really have to be uh, aware and conscious and and. Um, vigilant to continue to have that privilege. USC Canada is doing some really good work and especially in terms of the Bauda Family Initiative. Um, you can also look into the particip participatory plant breeding program that is in conjunction with U of M. Um, so there's, there's really some exciting things happening right here on the prairie in terms of seed sovereignty. We also need to protect our access to land. One of the things that the new agrarians have identified um, it, and also the new farmer coalition um, is that for new entrants into farming, the cost of land is prohibitive in many, many cases. And so we have maybe land trusts which will make uh, farmland available to new entrants into farming for a much more reasonable cost. And one of those land trusts here in Saskatchewan is the uh, Farmland Legacies. And I also have some flyers um, that you can pick up at the end of the session on their program. And finally, preserving our wetlands. Ducks Unlimited have a great program right now. I don't know if, you're, um, if you've seen their advertising, but they've got this really um, intensive Save Our Wetlands campaign with posters and especially on social media, um, just to make us aware of how important those wetlands are. For example, um, if you do not drain a wetland, you could be keeping up to 89 tons of CO2 per hectare out of the atmosphere. 
Every time a wetland is drained, that CO2 is released. And we are currently losing 4,000 hectares of wetlands per year. And so supporting that program, that um, initiative from Ducks Unlimited, I think is a, is a really uh, positive thing for us as organic farmers, including keeping our wetlands on our farms. I know that's uh, one of our badges of honor, I guess, is we have never drained any water. <laughs> we go around in circles, <laughs> that's all. The wetlands have a cooling and humidifying effect also on our regional climates. They also, of course, create habitat for many of our brother and sister relatives in the animal world and the bird world. Number five, knowledge sharing. Peer-to-peer -peer and intergenerational. I think we're very fortunate as organic farmers, again, in particular um, with an organiza a certification organization such as TCO CERT, which is, which is built on chapter um, organization and sharing of knowledge. But there's also field days that are being organized by multiple groups such as Sask Organics, Organic Alberta, and the Manitoba Organic Alliance. And so you can go and learn from your peers about different things. I know that's how we learned about Sainfoin and how to grow it. And we, we purchased the seed from um, Mr. Husbands. What's his first name? John. John Husbands. There we go. And so learning from that man about how, to, how this thing works uh, was really important. Number six, direct fair distribution chains. And so... Of course, we have our farmers' markets and our community-supported agriculture. We heard a gentleman speak this morning about um, a CSA bakery. My goodness, how, how exciting that is. Farm-to-folk distributions, online marketing, and fair trade. We have um, a farmer-owned, Farmer Direct, uh, which uh, also has that component where the labor is fairly uh, dealt with. So the fair trade logo being an important uh, component of agroecology and moving beyond just organic. Number seven, agroecology is political and requires us to transform the structures of power in society. Now, okay, maybe I am an activist or maybe I'm not. I'm just not really politically savvy. And so, as you see with my presentation, I depend a lot on National Farmers Union, who have people who look at policy and write policy papers and approach the government and lobby the government to support small-scale farmers, to support family farms, to support agroecological principles, so that we can move away from the huge agribusiness which has caused us so many problems. And I would like to remind you uh, for those of you who are able, that NFU are having their convention, their national convention in Saskatoon, very close by, um, just at the end of November here. Unfortunately, I'm going to be in Montreal that weekend, so I can't make it. I'd hope that some of you get there and maybe can report back and let me know what was going on. Number eight, youth and women being principal social bases for the evolution of agroecology. Uh, you may have heard many references during this weekend about the place, the role of women in agriculture, and also the great potential of the youth that are becoming involved in agriculture. We heard yesterday at the Young Agrarians uh, gathering that some of these young farmers are getting into farming for totally different reasons than what we did. They're getting into farming because that's the way they want to deal with social issues such as climate change, such as availability and accessibility to really good food. And so they're kind of an example for us to follow. You know, the young people will show us the way. And so I really encourage you to uh, check out the Young Agrarian's website um, and, and find out more about uh, the work that they do. They also, besides working with young people and networking with young people, um, they set up uh, mixers between farmland owners 
and new entrants into farming. And so that possibility of linking up with a, a young farmer uh, can be done through the young agrarians. And of course, through the National Farmers Union, the National New Farmer Coalition, which has a great deal of information. They are um, very present on social media. I didn't see a lot of reference on the NFU website, but there are little links that take you to, to the work that these young people are doing. And so, I'll end up with the challenge that I started with at the beginning. You can look at agroecology as a science, as a practice, and as a movement. And it's up to you at what level you want to become engaged in the whole process. Um, do you want to study the principles? Do you want to practice ecological farmers farming? And do you want to join the movement? But we do need everyone's engagement. And not just organic farmers. We all have a path to walk toward this, can both conventional and organic. But I think we often think that we have the solution already, and I think we need to move beyond just um, organic. We, we want to move past that. And I would close with a few uh, additional websites and resources that I would encourage you to check out. For example, the Soil Not Oil is an annual conference that is videotaped and you can access it online. And my goodness, do they have some interesting ideas and they really push the envelope. Um, also, Rodale, as I mentioned earlier, the Via Campesina, who are that peasant organization that you heard Miguel Altieri speak about, and who are the people who first coined um, agroecology as a political movement, a social movement. Neelenny.org is the organization that was started by Vandana Shiva in India, and they also have annual conferences and conventions which deal with many of these issues to access to food, access to good um, agricultural practices and resisting um, the sort of push of industrial farming. And the foodsovereignty.org forum uh, from the Neoleni. They, um, they produced um, a manifesto of sorts um, that we can maybe all kind of sign on to in our personal lives. So I'd like to take this moment first of all to thank my tech support and, and everybody that helped me to put this together uh, this morning. Uh, and I would invite you to, um, to ask any questions you would like. There's a microphone at the back, but it, I don't know, I think the group is maybe small enough that uh, if you have a, a decently strong voice, we may not have to get onto the, the microphone, but please feel free to ask any questions at this time. Thank you. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience at the conference in Paris? I know you started with a little bit of that, but just kind of, you right. know, a little bit more in, in depth of uh, the direction that was being taken there. Sure. Um, we went as a social, as a civil society organization, and as I said, I was not privy to um, the halls where the decisions were being made. But we were kept updated on a daily basis as to where the negotiations were going. And one of the really, uh, I guess, good things that came out of um, the agreement, the quote-unquote Paris Agreement, is that countries came to terms, came to realize that it was vital to stay under two degrees Celsius of warming and focus on staying at 1.5. Many of the Pacific Island nations that were rep represented at that negotiation are talking about their island countries disappearing underwater. And we had some really touching, moving testimonials from some of the women um, who spoke at, who spoke to the, the decision makers, to the policy makers. And 
they, they participated in something called slam poetry. And if you go on YouTube videos, you can see um, Isabella Borgeson from the Philippines and Kath, Kathy Kajiner, Jetno Kajiner from the uh, Marshall Islands. Powerful, powerful poetry. That's, yeah. So that, I think, was the moving part for me. Um, knowing that there was this uh, historic agreement signed and that 195 countries signed it was an important step because so many of the other climate summits had ended up with nothing. No agreement reached. The problem was um, the countries had to come to the negotiating table with a list of, okay, we're going to do this, do this, do this in our country to mitigate climate change. All of their actions totaled up to an increase of three degrees Celsius. So we need to really keep Justin Trudeau on, on his toes because we don't have enough yet. We've got to move beyond what um, he, well, he didn't really agree to anything because he wanted to consult with the provinces, right? So we need to keep our governments there, like keep them moving ahead because we're not going to get there with what they brought to the table last December. Now there's another COP, there's COP22 going on, well, I guess in December or very shortly again. Um, in Tunisia? Oh, I can't remember exactly. Um, so, where? Morocco. Morocco. So the other, um, I guess, flaw in the agreement is that there is no political um, constraint. There is no... If, if a country agreed to do something and they don't, they pull out, there's nothing. So we can't enforce it. So those are the two really difficult points about it. So you can hear all the good news, but underlying it is we still got lot, a long way to go. Thank you. No, I'm the heckler. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't look in the corner. Well, you are so, so yeah, well, I, I couldn't put one on my So anyways, the question is, do you think that it would be possible to educate all these conferences they have to educate the people who are there so they can educate others that when there is climate change, there's going to be a rise of water, and you know, the difference in point of view from the guy standing on the mountain and the guy standing on the beach is a hell of a lot different. And these are usually the people who sign. The mountain guys always sign these agreements, and while the other people are trying not to drown. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes that way with poor people and food. It goes that way with, yeah. with time trade. Um, most people, okay, we live here, we live at 1570 or whatever you call it, whatever Regina is above sea level, we say, oh, it's not a big deal, the water comes up, except this year the water is just falling. Well, when the water falls here, it gets there later. And we have a different perspective <coughs> on water and uses of energy than people who don't have these, where they live. It's, it's a problem of where you live, it's a problem of how you live, and how many people who live in the tower, who <laughs> don't know how the people who live in the basement are yeah. faring. Well, yeah, essentially, the developed world are responsible for most of the greenhouse gases, but the people in the developing world or the um, global south are the ones who feel the effects mm -hmm. first, especially around the equator and especially, as you say, at sea level. Um, so that's, that's definitely one of the issues. We are, I think, <coughs> beneficiaries. Yeah, we've got to adapt to different um, weather patterns. But in Saskatchewan, basically, we are beneficiaries of, of climate change in the sense of, you know, milder winters and, and longer growing seasons, maybe the ability to, to grow a different crop a little further north. I think there's a lot of people are looking around and going, I don't mind this. I don't mind warmer winters. But there's a whole lot of things that come with that. Our pests are going to be different. Um, 
People who can no longer grow food in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where are they going to go? The Syrian refugee crisis, where do you think that came from? That started with climate change drought. Years and years of drought, which created internal turmoil, and now these people don't have anywhere to go. So we're, we're looking at um, an influx in the more temperate regions of people who can no longer live along the equator or who can no longer live in their island countries. Another thing, in the Eskimo language, whatever language they speak, they had to invent in the last 15 years a word for the word, for the bird robin. Because ah, they had never, never seen one or never robin. had it up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is a change in climate. Oh, there's been some documentaries about the change in the ice. Yep. And and the that they're having to change their hunting habits and whatever because of what's going on with the ice. We're going to be able, apparently, to sail right across the Arctic in the summertime. Come the next, I don't, I forget how many years, but not, not maybe not even not in my lifetime. Hope you're not good that now. There's some people think that's a good thing. Uh, no, well, some people would say yeah. that's a good thing that they could say we could sail across the Arctic because then we don't have to go all the way around the bottom of the continent. Uh, I'm not cruise ship. Yeah, they got the cruise ship now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you really, when you think when you think about that, it's not that you think, well, the ice disappears. It's going to be great, you know, economically. We can send the cruise ship there. We can shorten the whatever the hell we want to call it. But you know, there's actually land that is frozen solid, and that land holds down billions of cubic miles of methane because mm -hmm. it's frozen, and when that Thaws out. Well, and the, the whole acidification. Gaining, gaining a whole lot of land up there. I just talked to a guy last night yeah. that was actually flowing over there. He said you can see the bones from whales and stuff because the land, the ice is in there yeah. and the ground's covered up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And if that doesn't scare people, what, yeah. what does it take to scare them? Yeah. yeah, even like Greenland is disappearing, you know? And that's all contributing <clears throat> to the acidification of the oceans and the disappearance of the coral reefs. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just, I just want to make one, one little comment. What we're seeing in our, you know, with hemp and really kind of starting to see on the organic movement and whatnot. Three years ago, I wouldn't even talk to you. I thought I'd even be here, but you know, that's uh, and I, I, I think it's wonderful what I am. But uh, I think it all starts in our with our kids that are growing up. <clears throat> I kind of uh, equate it to uh, drinking and driving. My kids now would never ever drink and drive because they were taught that in school, and I think that's kind of where we're not going to change. The, we're not going to change the, the, the earth and, or the world in one day, but we get some really progressive young kids that are <clears throat> going to go up and start reclaiming some of that land back in Syria and our problem areas and stuff like that. And, and uh, yeah, I think anyhow, that's just. <laughs> yes. So uh, for those young progressive kids. Um, you know, I see a lot of them getting into agriculture for, for these reasons, but I think once they're kind of into it for a few years, they definitely feel the burden, mm -hmm. um, and they worry about things like that, and they get depressed. Um, so what advice, like as somebody who's been part of this movement for a lot longer, um, and has seen, has been a lot of, a part of these really cool experiences like Paris, what, what advice would you give to them? Back with your shoes. Trust the process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you gotta have faith. It's like Barbie. It's like Barbie. You gotta have faith, right? Yeah. 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 Trust that the universe will respond to your best hmm. intentions and efforts. I'd, I'd like to say uh, that that song that uh, Solange? Solange sang uh, about the planting, you know, maybe that's part of what you're saying yeah. about the process where I, I know often I get frustrated and I know who she is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> around me. Mm -hmm. And I guess at times when I want to give up, she, I just stand there and her naivety and mm -hmm. optimism mm -hmm. helps. Other times it doesn't. But that song, is, I think, really meant a lot to me because it's like, 
uh, it does also say you don't know when the opportunity is going to come. Mm -hmm. And so if it's spring, you plant. In the summer, you wait for rain. In the fall, you harvest. In the winter, you, you plant to do it again. Catalogs and you plant. <laughs> do it again. <laughs>